Hi, everyone. I've chosen a slightly contentious headline for the start of my talk here in Sweden, but I, I hope you'll hear me out. Um, first and foremost, very, very, very happy to be here. Um, I've seen and heard some amazing talks the last couple of days, and I'm feeling a little bit of pressure to be the last one to finish this all off. So please bear with me. Uh, my name is Alexis. As you heard, um, I, I'm here to talk to you guys about some what I think very, very important stuff uh, because we have an amazing internet. Uh, and if I think most of you will agree, it is not a fad. It is going to be around for a little while, and I want to see that we make the most out of it. Uh, now, for the non-Swedes here, um, I've used this wonderfully Swedish term called lagom. I don't know how my pronunciation is. But it is an amazing word that actually does not translate into English, um, which could say something about our respective cultures. Uh, it doesn't mean, it means sort of not too much, not too little, sort of just about right, lagom. And, and it's an amazing, wonderful word. And, and sort of when applied to society, I think we would all agree that this is a very desirable goal, right? That everyone has enough. Uh, when it comes to the internet, though, and when it comes to the things that I hope many of you want to do on that wonderful World Wide Web, I hope we don't settle for just that. Uh, because the people who have the most to lose, the powerful who have the most to lose from this new platform, will not settle at Lagom. And that's why it's so important for us to make sure that we take full advantage of these opportunities we have. Now, normally, uh, I talk a lot about startups. Uh, these are the companies I've started. They all have cute mascots. I just like drawing cute mascots for all the things I start. I'm not going to talk about them today, um, but you're welcome to tweet at me about Reddit or Hitmonk or BreadPig, um, and I hope you use all of them in whatever your daily activities might require. Um, but today I wanted to talk about something else. I'm, I'm leaning on some of the lessons that I learned. Uh, I'm also leaning on some of the, the good fortune that I had in playing a role in the fight against SOPA and PIPA, as you heard. Um, that, was, that was something that, that months before... The blackout happened on January 18th uh, when I joined the fight. There were people fighting this for years, literally years before I even got on board. And uh, it was because of their work that we were able to do something that everyone in DC said was literally unthinkable, uh, like unimaginable. Uh, there's $94 million in lobbying by the entertainment industry that was going to make sure those two bills passed. They had Democrats and Republicans signed up, co-sponsoring it. It was a done deal. And thanks to a bunch of people with an internet connection and a telephone, they were able to stop this because millions of Americans actually raised up and showed that they can still defeat lobbyists in Washington, which I can tell you uh, was something that surprised even me. Uh, but then look forward, that momentum carried over and a terrible bill named ACTA was slammed down here in Europe thanks to a bunch of enterprising citizens with internet connections and telephones. Again, same kind of communication technology. Uh, and this was a big deal, uh, but it, it has to only be the beginning. Now, I, I should actually start from the beginning. Um, before I was doing the like interview thing, and li that was literally one of the only times outside of weddings that I've worn a tie, um, this is what Steve and I looked like maybe a week after we started Reddit. Um, we had just graduated from college. We were 22 years old. Actually, I think Steve was still 21. And neither of us had any idea what the fuck we were doing. Not a clue. No idea. We were, we were in no business to be running a business. Um, but that turned out to be a great asset. Not knowing just how in over our heads we were, not knowing what we were doing, not knowing what we should have been doing, actually was a huge strength that I'm gonna get back to a little later in the talk and that I hope you all can also embrace because it is one of the best assets we have right now <laughs> as people trying to make our dents in the universe using the internet uh, because no one knows what they are doing. In fact, you see me now, this is the product of like eight years of still not knowing what I am doing. Uh, anyone who claims that, oh yeah, they know what they're doing, they're lying, all right? Uh, or they're just not trying hard enough. Um, I am constantly trying to fail and put myself into situations where I am learning new things because I feel like that's the only way to keep moving forward. Uh, and especially when there's so much new stuff coming. Uh, we need to be comfortable in that. And that's a big part of what I'm here to talk about. Now I wanted to show something to you guys that I'm not terribly proud of. Uh, this is the first screenshot of Reddit. This is the very moment after we launched it. I screen capped it. There are a couple of test posts that Steve submitted, but you'll see the very first post to Reddit 
It was just, remember, this is me and Steve in a little apartment in Somerville, Massachusetts, and the first post I submitted was a link to the Downing Street memo. I don't know if if you guys remember this, uh, but a little ways back, uh, a memo was leaked out of the British government that uh, recorded, or that had recorded conversations with the White House, uh, then the Bush administration, essentially indicating that there were plans for the war in Iraq much sooner than WMD were purportedly found. And it was a rather damning memo. Uh, I unfortunately didn't shorten that war, Um, but it was a powerful moment, uh, and it certainly shed some light on where this world was headed, right? Certainly in the context of WikiLeaks, in the context of the recent NSA revelations by Edward Snowden, uh, it was an interesting bit of foreshadowing. And it was just coincidence. I, trust me, we did not launch Reddit in order to be a part of this thing. We, we launched Reddit just so we could have a place to find new and interesting links. Uh, and if you'll also humor me, back then there was no Twitter, there was no Tumblr, it was just Facebook, uh, which was then just limited to college sites or colleges in the United States, uh, a site called Flickr and Delicious. I Flickr still around despite Yahoo's best efforts to destroy it. And uh, <laughs> Delicious, well... Same kind of story there. But the point is, this is what the first version of it looked like. Uh, and again, remember, we didn't know what we were doing. If that's not clear from how this looks, um, we didn't know what we were doing, but we launched something. And so often I meet people, and I'm not just talking about startup founders, and I certainly meet plenty of them, but just people who are being entrepreneurial, people who are doing new things in the arts, in philanthropy, who get hung up not wanting to launch, not wanting to get something out in the world because they're embarrassed. And the point is, if you're not a little embarrassed, you probably waited too long to launch that thing. Uh, This is my reminder because it really did start from a pretty humble beginning. And the observant members of the crowd will notice that Steve downvoted me. I have negative one karma because he's a dick. Uh, <laughs> um, but <laughs> one, of the, one of the things that I really wanted to dwell upon was that, you know, so many of us talk about the internet as this amazing revolutionary communication platform, myself included. But the reality is the 20th century has been full or was full of amazing world-changing revolutionary communication platforms. In fact, many of the things we read about the internet today were said about things like telephone and radio and television and every single one of them which started out with the highest-minded democratic ideals, these, these, these amazing opportunities, right, where we thought anyone, finally, anyone has their soapbox. Anyone can share an idea with the world. They'll, just, they'll, they'll have their own radio station, or they can broadcast it anywhere, and people can hear, and it can mobilize. It'll be amazing. And in every single instance, these revolutionary communication platforms, either through government or through business or some combination of the both, became closeted, became controlled, and became to represent the oligarchies, uh, or oligopolies and monopolies that they are today. Uh, And every one of those platforms had such high hopes. In fact, uh, Tim Wu, a fabulous researcher back in the States, wrote an entire book about this called The Master Switch, which I really recommend you read. Uh, There is every reason, historically speaking, for the internet to follow the same route, the same route that telephones did, the same route radio did, the same route that television did, and not be the thing that we hope and dream it can be. But it doesn't have to be that way. And the biggest asset that we have in fighting that is by simple fact that this is a wonderful two-way mechanism and that we can create content as easily as we can receive it, so long as all links are created equal. Uh, I, this is this is an, an interesting point because uh, there's a a dude, Tom Friedman, who wrote a very popular book called The World is Flat, and he's wrong. The world is not flat. We've known this for a little while, Tom. I don't know what he was thinking. Um, But the World Wide Web is, technologically, when all links are created equal, it is a hierarchy-free system. But it's not guaranteed to be that way. Uh, And there are lots of companies that have their best interests in mind uh, in not making it so that all links are created equal, making it so that if you buy the you know, default internet package, you'll get Yahoo search for free. But if you want Google, that's gonna be an extra $20 a month. Just imagine the worst cable experience and then apply that to your internet connection. Um, it's a kind of terrifying prospect and it's one that we thought we had put away for a little while, but it seems to keep creeping back up. But again, we also have to remember, this is a technologically democratic platform but it's still being used by society, which is unfortunately anything but. We still bring our own biases and our own flaws onto these wonderful platforms, right? And so as we talk about the merits and the values of this great technology, we have to remember to be good stewards of it. We have to remember the fact that 
internet access is still not a universal right, or even really far from it, certainly in my home country. Uh, millions of Americans literally can't even get internet access because companies won't provide it to them and then also won't let them build it themselves. Uh, and so there are literally kids going to McDonald's to use the Wi-Fi to do their homework. Uh, then you've got the simple fact that yes, we bring with us as a society all the other ills that a free and wonderful communication platform can let anyone share. And we have, to, we have to find great ways to take advantage of that. And we have to make sure, and we heard from so many, so many people the last two days, that we are not being silent and that we're using opportunities to, through more free speech, shout and show what is actually right and what we actually want to be the way the world is. Now, none of this is guaranteed. And that's, that's the frustrating thing, uh, because there's so much promise, right? There's so much potential when you can tell anyone with an internet connection and the skills to make the most out of it that they can be awesome on it. They can create things on it. They can do whatever they want. They can spread their awesome. Uh, but again, none of it is guaranteed. What is interesting, though, is that this has already started changing. Slowly, but surely, this has started changing. And, and I want to be clear here, you know, these platforms themselves do not bring about the change. Uh, it would be just as silly, but you know, saying something like uh, Twitter created the Arab Spring is just as silly as saying that you know television media helped win the civil rights movement in the United States. It, they certainly helped, but they did not do it. People do it. And the fact that we have more of these platforms doesn't necessarily mean that they get into everyone's hands. And that is the challenge, uh, and I've met so many people across the country and across the world who have been able to take stabs at this and start whittling away at the power structures that exist. Remember this, this talk is, or this conference I should say, is about lies, power, and disruption. So the reality that we live in is one where the people who have traditionally had the authority, have had the power, are now seeing it whittled away by people who want to simply have their voice be heard. And a very, very specific example uh, is actually from a friend of mine named Latoya Peterson, uh, who's the editor of a fabulous blog called Racialicious, uh, which essentially discusses the intersection of race and popular culture in America. And now here, to me, is a perfect example of something that clearly, and it has been and continues to be quite successful, that clearly always had an audience. There were always people who were interested in this content, and yet, for some reason, the marketplace was not creating it for them. And you know what? It's getting a little bit more efficient. It's now an opportunity for her to create something that actually produces a voice, produces content that people want, that want to share and talk about. And what's so wonderful, what gives me so much hope is she tells me some of her most avid readers, <laughs> she gets emails from 14-year-old boys and girls who probably <laughs> may or may not be reading the site with their parents' permission. Uh, who, who are getting a perspective on the world that simply was not available. This is, again, this is the internet at its best. When we can actually start to provide those resources and see them thrive and actually see supply meet demand, which in some cases is actually a really inspiring thing to watch. Now, there are instances time and time again where I'm seeing the old stand, standby media have to deal with the new changing social media world we live in. I can't wait until we get rid of the whole social thing in front of it, it just sounds silly. Um, <laughs> but the fact is, the impact is already being made. Uh, there was a case in the United States uh, a few years ago that was absolutely brought to light thanks to social media, but really because of a bunch of people, remember, who actually pushed an issue forward. Uh, it did not bring us justice, but it actually brought attention and it brought a little closer, it brought us a little bit closer to it. And that was, of course, the Trayvon Martin case. Um, and I know from friends of mine who are broadcast journalists who have been a part of traditional media, sorry, uh, for a very long time and who would have been the first ones to hear about that story, they all, they conceded to me, not on the air, but they conceded to me that the way they heard about this was through their Twitter account. It was actually by reading random tweets from a bunch of random people who just had random internet connections, that this was made into a big enough deal that enough light could be focused on it, that at least some steps could be taken. Now again, this is, again, it's not a cure-all. This is a process. But what's so heartening is that it is one that so far we seem to be winning. Uh, but it is one that is absolutely not guaranteed. And so when I hear stories like that, and I know people like Latoya, I get really hopeful and I get really excited because at the end of the day, I just want better stuff in the world. 
And to me, the prospect of more people getting more access, spreading more of their ideas is going to mean better stuff. It's going to mean better art. It'll hopefully mean better journalism. It could hopefully even mean better politics. And that, to me, that, that gets me really excited. That's the kind of world that I want to live in. And I always have to remind, uh, when I'm, if, I, if I'm talking about this sort of thing back in the States, I have to just take a moment and just send a message out there to all of my fellow straight white dudes. Listen, it's going to be okay. It's going to really, it's going to be fine. I know it, it seems, seems a little scary, a little troubling. I know this power structure has worked out pretty well for us for a very long time. I know that. But really, it's going to be okay. And, and this is something that... Uh, this is something that we are in such a unique position to take advantage of. And when I say we, I mean all of you in the room, right? We are lucky enough to be here at a conference like this talking about making websites and changing media using technology. This is already putting us in a pretty damn good position, right? We're already in a pretty good place. And so like Uncle Ben, if you're a fan of Spider-Man, or I guess Voltaire probably said it first, um, with great power comes great responsibility. And so I would hope, I would hope that we see this as a tremendous advantage uh, that we have and a, and, a, and a responsibility, frankly, that we have to make the most out of. Because I don't want to imagine the alternatives. I really don't. Uh, because we see every day what it has gotten us. We see every day what it has put us into. And particularly for this generation of, of the millennials who are there. That's another phrase. I don't know why. Did it, was no one consulted on this brand stuff? Um, <laughs> we have this amazing opportunity. We have this amazing chance because all of the status quo, all of the conventions that we were told actually didn't turn out to be that way, right? It was go to college, go for four years, you'll get a job when you're done. Don't worry about the student loan debt. It's going to be fine. You'll have a job. Not so much the case. Uh, we, we have lost a tremendous amount of faith in our governments. We have lost a tremendous amount of faith in our media. We've, tr we've lost a lot of faith in stuff, all right? But there is one thing that seems to keep coming back, which is this, this relentless optimism that I can't help but feel when I'm talking to people all across the country and all across the world who are doing this amazing stuff that they wouldn't have before thanks to that internet connection and thanks to the people who are helping build this wonderful World Wide Web. Uh, because one of the advantages we have over telephone and radio and film is that this really is a two-way medium at scale. And it really does, you know, there was a Supreme Court justice like two decades ago that talked about the internet as being a soapbox for anyone. And it's still not the most efficient world of soapboxes, but it is an opportunity to have a global soapbox, and it is also an opportunity to have a global library, right? Like, we live at a time when the world's knowledge is more accessible than ever. Still, not where it needs to be, but more accessible than ever. And we have a generation of people from the internet who are coming into this without any real expectations, without any real biases about how the world ought to work, because by and large, those models have all not worked out for them. Right? We, we come into this with a great asset because of that ignorance. Now, I'm not advocating ignorance. <laughs> what I'm advocating is accepting the fact that we still don't know where this is all headed. And we, we are pretty much convinced that the internet is going to be around. I think we'll all agree it'll still be around. If we can keep it open, if we can keep fighting for it and keep building things on it, there is no limit to how many industries will be affected by it. Right? Now, disruption. That's the other big part of this conference. Everyone, we want to disrupt all the things. And I get really excited talking about, yeah, disrupt everything. Uh, but the reality is we don't know. We really don't know what's coming. And the incumbents, all the people who have so much to lose, are even more clueless and the least ready to adapt. And so in the meantime, we can be drinking all of that milkshake. right? We can be using this opportunity because as is certainly the case in startups and, and, and thus far what I've seen in the worlds of activism and even philanthropy, uh, there is a reticence. There is a, there is a definite hesitation to embrace so much of this new model, uh, so much of how to really bring about something really with the internet. Uh, and that doesn't mean that we're totally guaranteed to succeed, not at all. Uh, but it means we have an amazing advantage over those incumbents. And it, that is our great strength. It is actually that fact that we don't really know what we're doing. That is the power. We are doing things that, that have not been able to scale this far 
And there's something kind of magical about the fact that it works in this decentralized manner. Right now, Kenyatta, I'm going to have to take an issue. I, I do now call it uh, I do now call it GIF, which is frustrating to me because I always called it GIF. But <laughs> what we saw there in that talk was a glimpse of this <laughs> through wonderful animated GIFs. Uh, we saw a glimpse of what these ideas can do when they spread and how, yet again, the most efficient model, the model that thrives online, is not the hierarchical top-down one. It is the organic, bottom-up, whatever you want to call it, democratic one. Um, but like I said, none of this is guaranteed. Neither the structure and openness of the internet is guaranteed, nor the fact that we can shed, hopefully, uh, or at least most of, so much of the things that have hampered us as a society this far, right? It just because it's on the internet does not mean inequality magically goes away, all right? But it does provide an opportunity. There is a way to get us there and for traditionally marginalized voices to actually be heard, to actually coordinate and and that is exciting, right? That is, that is the hope. That means we get the better things. That means we get, like I said, the better news, the better art, the better businesses, the better nonprofits, and even, yes, maybe the better politicians. But I don't know. I really, I, 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 I get to speak at a ton of conferences, and I always get so inspired because the audiences seem to get a little bit bigger. There always seems to be, uh, especially here, by the way, rock on with the 50-50, maybe I think, I think 52 women, was it? Um, that's exciting. But we are still so far from where we need to be. And I'm, I'm thinking specifically to the United States because, unfortunately, as much as I love Sweden, I don't know Sweden as well as I know the States. Um, but on a global level, I think we can all certainly agree we're not nearly where we need to be. But we're on that path. And what I hope is that as more people realize how much opportunity there is here, we'll get more people taking those chances and not being halted by the fact that eh, maybe it's a little embarrassing. Maybe no one's going to see it. Maybe I, who, who, who cares? Just create. Please, 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 please be pushing someone to be creating, to be starting that blog, to be making that silly animated GIF, even to be making that advice animal. Uh, I, I think there is absolutely value to this knowledge and this, this, this kind of um, hunger. Uh, for, for creation, uh, because the internet is that amazing platform for both creation and sharing as well as learning. And once someone has that, once someone has those skills and that access, it's like kind of like uh, kind of like superpowers. Uh, and in mass, it can do really, really amazing things. And I, I obviously, I get really excited on the startup side. I, re I get really excited about the future of where so many industries that have traditionally been pretty broken are going to be solved through technology. Um, media is, is perhaps the most challenging and arguably most important, right? Because in a democratic society, I'd wager, it's, probably, it's right up there with education in terms of being extremely important. And yet we still don't have a business model that totally works for media production. The good news is the cost falls every day, right? The cost of producing and scaling ideas falls every day. But we still don't have sustainable models for it. And maybe we don't need it, but maybe we do. Um, I, I would wager that until we figure that out, we'll still be searching, but it is a process. And I know we are going in the right direction. Uh, and I know that just from hearing the talks today uh, and yesterday and from talking to all these people here, uh, I know we're going the right direction. But at the end of the day, like I started this talk, I still don't know what I'm doing. Uh, what makes me hopeful, though, is that there's a whole lot of you who have spent the last two and a half, three days thinking about this stuff, meeting people, coming up with new ideas, some of you planning to quit your jobs, which is great. I mean, you know, maybe you have a great job, but still. <laughs> and wanting to take that initiative. Um, because that's what it's going to take. And it's going to take more people spreading those ideas for the good ideas to eventually win. And I, I really, really, really do believe that they can. So at this point, all I have to ask is, what are you guys waiting for? All right, do not wait for anyone's permission to be awesome. Just go forth and do it. And then tweet me about, about it so that I may take all the credit for you being awesome. Uh, thank you. <laughs> No. And if it's not implied by the image, you, you have my axe. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. I have some excellent news. This time we really do have time for questions and conversation. You warned me. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, no, I, I was very strict <laughs> about that. Um, 
Yeah, so let's let's see if we can get some house lights, uh, perhaps. And the microphone uh, people are at the ready. And and do we have a question already? Indeed, yes, Hi. we do. Yes, ma. Yes. Hi, my name is Emily Best. I'm the founder and CEO of Seed and Spark. We're using the internet to disrupt uh, Hollywood. Yes. Yes. Um, Thank you. You're welcome. You have Thank his you. axe. Yeah. Um, I'm going to take your axe. Uh, I'm really curious to hear you talk about um, the openness of the internet and the dangers, as you were quick to point out, of mapping our own social biases right on top of the beautiful open platform. Oh. Um, what are successful techniques um, and, uh, and opportunities to make sure we don't just bring all of our existing hierarchies right on to the internet? Yeah, okay. I'm gonna presume everyone heard that, so I don't need to repeat mm -hmm. it. Okay. Yeah. <sighs> okay, well, it, it is something we are still figuring out. Um, technologically speaking, I don't know if there is an answer. Um, from a simple technological standpoint, I, I think the answer is technology empowered humans. And let me let me get. I'm not talking about cyborgs, um, <laughs> but maybe. Uh, <laughs> let me be specific. Um, you know, the fact that uh, the, 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 we have okay, the gift and the curse of an open communication platform, whether it's Twitter or Reddit or Facebook, is that anyone has their soapbox. Now, it could be the Westboro Baptist Church, and they've got lots of Twitter accounts, and they're assholes, um, or it could be. Uh, uh, some not assholeish person um, <laughs> could just be a normal person, um, and in most cases, I would argue it's just sort of benign. Uh, it's just normal people tweeting about their cat or posting a link to a photo of their cat on Reddit or what have you. Um, and so, I I personally don't think the answer is curbing those accounts. I don't think it's necessarily that. I think it's winning with the right kind of speech because more. I really do believe that most people are reasonable. And so the way to win is with an overwhelming amount of <laughs> reasonableness, of awesomeness, of good stuff. And, and I'll give you a specific example. Um, and, and, you know, actually, I mean, this is something that we heard all weekend. Uh, but it's just simply the fact that uh, we do have our, our little soapboxes. And, and, you know, depending on our Twitter followers or Reddit followers or whatever, uh, it may be a little bigger here and there. But the fact is we all have an opportunity to say something. And... Uh, there was, a, there was an incident that made basically everyone look bad uh, called um, like Donglegate, uh, involving one named, woman named Adria Richards. You can Google it. Um, but anyway, it was, it, it was an example of the, the sort of worst case scenario of discussion on the internet that devolved really quickly. And like I said, it just, it just, it got, it went bad real fast. And um, a lot of it stemmed from, it was a sort of, it started out as a tech community thing. And as a member of the tech community, uh, I wrote a blog post about it. Uh, and you can read all that. Um, but the, 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 the meat of it was basically like, don't be fucking ridiculous. Like, come on, we can, we can talk about this in a civil way. We can have strong feelings without resorting to the really, really awful kind of language and threats and stuff that people are willing to do when they're behind a keyboard. You know, when I heard Cindy talk about how she responded to those YouTube commenters in her keynote yesterday, I wanted to cheer. Um, it was it would have been rude if I had stood up and cheered, but like that is exact like that that is that is awesomeness. And so the best thing I can do is say that was awesome, um, but like try to help uh, when it involves me or something that I am a part of uh, in terms of an online community. So, uh, so it's, it's using the status, the whatever we may have, whether our following is two people or 200, uh, to actually say what we feel about issues like this. But I know it's not an easy solution, and I'm just the startup guy. Like, I'm not, I'm not trying to fight the social justice fight as a leader. I, I am just trying to help, you know, lend my axe where I can. But then the question is, shouldn't you, on some way, I mean, not to maybe necessarily like carry the flag in the whole social justice mm. justice fight, but but in some way, the whole problem is that everybody should, and, and all the nice average people posting the problem with structural injustices, right, mm. is that all the average nice people posting pictures of their cats may be at the same time unwillingly yeah. sexist and yeah. racist, for instance, and all kinds of other ableists and so on. Yeah. Um, so... So w while I applaud this, I also mm. feel that that there is a, that your that the optimism, your optimism, I love it, but 
maybe it's a little impractical. All, all of my social justice friends who are doing this for a living and changing the world uh, are much less optimistic. Yes, I think I think I think the optimism is a symptom of just me being who I am, um, but also the fact that. Okay, well, let me give you let me give you a specific example that uh, mm -hmm. that actually happened on Reddit that I thought was a net positive thing, even though it was an awful situation. I th I think that normal normal people, the sort of average person who is sort of inadvertently, let's say, racist or whatever ist you want to use, um, they are on the whole still good people, if perhaps misinformed and wrong, um, and it's only in public that these kind of conversations can happen. Where you know, if I am I'm just going to stereotype, but like, okay, if, if I have a, a cloistered group of friends who are all just like me, I won't have the awkward conversation where I say something and be corrected for it. When I do that, when I make that same statement on social media and I can be corrected for it, whether it's Cindy Gallup sending me a message um, or, or whether it's a bunch of people telling me I'm an idiot, but, but hopefully being more productive, mm. um, that's an opportunity to learn and I hope that's where change comes from. And the specific example that I'm thinking of um, happened when, oh man, uh, this was like a year ago and a Sikh woman was photographed uh, with, with just sort of standing in line in public uh, and it was posted to the photo, a link to the photo was posted on um, uh, Funny. it's a subreddit for funny photos. Um, and the reason it was funny, or at least the reason the poster thought it was funny, uh, was because she had a lot of facial hair. And he had not seen this before, he thought it was amusing, he takes a photo and he posts it. Yeah, if you haven't seen it, it's a lady who has a beard. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. A lot of let's facial hair. I'm just, let's follow this story and see where it goes. Yes. yes. And, and what happened in the discussion around that was absolutely amazing because the the, uh, so again, this photo was submitted, I think it was to Imager, uh, and I got a link to on Reddit, uh, and the woman who had this photo taken of her actually came on to the discussion and said, let me explain. And she writes this amazing couple of paragraphs, just like straight badass, where she's like, I'm Sikh. This is why we don't shave. This is why I do what I do. If you want, next time, just take a photo with me. Like, I'm proud of this. And just like hundreds of thousands of people who are reading that comment thread, if they have any ounce of humanity in them, were like, Damn, like she, at that point she could have dropped her mic and everyone just would have, like, it just would have been a roaring applause, but it got even better because the original poster came back on and said, I am a total asshole. I am so, 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 so sorry. I've learned something. I will never do this again. Thank you for teaching me about Sikh culture and I'm a total douchebag. I'm sorry I did that. And I, I, this is one data point, but, you know, hearing stuff like what Cindy has done, what so many people have done, that to me feels like a bit of progress. And because it could happen, and I know it sucks that it happened publicly, it is awful for her. I mean, I, I, she, she clearly doesn't need my sympathy because she's just a baller. Mm -hmm. But like, that, that was able to be a, really, I think, a learning moment. I know that sounds really cliche, but it was a learning moment for hundreds of thousands of people who I hope the next time they see a woman with a beard will obviously not, obviously not, uh, photograph that consent, but also um, not post it and think it's funny, or even just chuckle to their friends. And here's the thing, for hundreds of years, thousands of years, there were undoubtedly people who walked around, saw a woman with a beard, and had a laugh with their friends. And that was, these were obviously moments that had been perpetuated for that history, that never got to be corrected. And I would hope that seeing something like that, seeing a correction, especially such a public one like that, can actually start winning people over. And that can make the learnable <sighs> moment. Uh, and another, I love this American expression, a teachable, a teachable moment. moment. That's the cliche. I'm because sorry. Beca no, but because you can actually, but because you can take this. Like, I mean, I felt when I, I, I read articles about this, uh, it's incredibly moving and you should all look this up. It's easily Read Googleable. her response, it's amazing. Uh, uh, but also mm -hmm. that you can show that, you know, post that link and say, oh my God, this can also happen on the internet. And you can show, um. and at the same time, of course, teach people about Sikh culture. And I'm sure we have questions in the audience. Let's have some more. Or, you know, statements, if they're really brief, like no longer than one sentence. There you go. Hello. Oh, um, hi, uh, my name is Laurie Penny. I'm a oh, journalist hey. and writer. <laughs> hey, we met yesterday. Yeah. Um, I, I'm really interested by what you're saying and you're flagging up of the awesome moments of the responses to online abuse and, to, and racism. But, um, but the thing is, I, I don't mean to be a downer here, but for every Cindy Gallup and for every... I read that discussion as well with the uh, Sikh woman who came back to the Reddit poster. It was, really, it was really, really amazing. But for 
every one of those, there are people out there who don't come back, who just disappear offline. There's a massive chilling of speech going on um, when it comes to women and people of color and queer people, trans people who are being attacked more and more right now as that's getting easier. And, and you talk about being awesome. I mean, personally, me, I, I started out creating stuff online and trying to change culture in my own little way, I guess, around five or six years ago. And, and currently, something's happening in the UK where women who use the internet to talk and to make political statements are being targeted. I mean, a couple of weeks ago, I, I received a bomb threat. I, re mm. I received a great deal. I mean, every day I, I log onto the internet. People are calling me a stupid girl and a cunt and a whore. And actually, looking through all of this stuff, after a day of that, I don't feel like I have the energy to be awesome anymore. I feel like it's it's a massive deal to to just to stay there, and that's I feel like that's a that's a big problem right now. So I, I guess. I guess if there's a question, it's how do we how do we make that better? How do we enable people to be awesome? I, yes. I mean, I know you mentioned Latoya Peterson as well. She, I know she deals with this as well. Right exactly. now. And and I'd like yeah. to take that and just like even be even more specific. Do you think? Do you think? Could you imagine ways of taking like your energy and optimism, and and transferring some of that mm -hmm. to Laurie on a day when she needs it? Well, what what she may not realize is, you know, I, I can more specifically answer your optimism question. Part of the reason I have this optimism is because I saw your talk yesterday, and and you and your fellow like like women were 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 discussing just how much how much it means to you to do what you do, uh, and how it sound. I mean, it, it really sounded to me like yes. I mean, you, you talked about the bomb threat, and this is awful stuff that no human deserves to have. Um, but that it was such an inspiration, and such an inspiration for the young women who you said email you and say, why should I get into this? Um, I, I, you know, a bunch of us actually were remarking after that talk that we wished it had been broadcasted like on CNN at prime time. No offense, I know it was live streamed, but um, that it, that it could have had a larger discussion. Um, so I don't, I don't want to. I don't. I hope this isn't a cop out, but I would broadcast things like the discussions that were had yesterday, um, and 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 to see enough support rally around that. Um, you know that I, I, I know. I know a happy face alone is not going to solve problems that are systemic and have been around for thousands of years. I know that. Um, but I don't know, I, I, I draw most of my optimism from the men, women, others who are using the internet to, to, to be awesome and well, in, in the face of so much of this adversity. Then one answer to this, of course, is that you do have a gi ginormous platform and so do very many of you in the audience and this talk is available and uh, you can find the link and you can spread it. And um, it's not going to be a CNN, but you have a lot of friends who have a lot of friends. And, and we can make it reach quite a lot of people should you decide to do that. And there are a lot of talks from this conference, I think, mm -hmm. that deserve, to deserve that. And so that, that would be a micro action, again, that we, could, that we can take with, with us that is constructive. But I'm, I'm going to follow up a little bit on what Laurie says. And also, I, could we move the microphone to the next question while I'm doing that, which is down here? Um, it, there is a... a, a, a there seems to be a development where we're moving more, again, into gated communities mm -hmm. for reasons to having to do with safety. And so and it's, it's very been very important all the time with the internet to be able to find your tribes, yeah. the tribes that are not, uh, that you're, where you're not tied to your geographical location. And that need and that fantastic quality of the internet is the very opposite uh, in somewhere of this sort of town square being called out uh, mechanism that you're talking about. And I think many of the platforms that start open end up being being gated communities, or at yeah. least posses of friends, mm -hmm. very fast. So where can we? Where can we? Can we? Can we design for for this kind of interaction with strangers, or with people who are less like us? So, so Eli Pariser, Paris. I always forget how to pronounce your last name, Eli. I'm sorry. Um, who started Upworthy before that move on? Wrote a great book called The Filter Bubble, and and talks about how so much technology is sort of um, so many. Whether it's your Google search results or what have you. Uh, is actually better because it connects you to more like-minded people. And look, if I put on my technologist hat, I'm like, yeah, that makes sense. My search results are probably going to be more useful for me if I'm searching for an MP3 player uh, because it knows what I might be. Like that, that to me is safe and good. But when I run a search for Syria and my results are very different from my neighbors, that's a bigger problem. Mm -hmm. And you know, the best, the the best thing. In, 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 so the challenge is, okay, can you make a product that is both popular enough to scale? as well as able to show sort of viewpoints you may not necessarily like. It, it Ostensibly, it seems like those are counterintuitive. It seems like 
one can't necessarily do that. Um, but I, it, it must be possible. Uh, and and there's, the, there's the sort of injection of serendipity, which you can imagine, which would be, you know, you've got your Twitter followers, but let's say, you know, if, if everyone you're following is on the left, it just, you, you get injected with tweets from the right or vice versa. Or mm -hmm. you, could, you could algorithmically experiment with ways to start showing people different viewpoints. But the problem is as soon as, as soon as you dictate as soon as you start editorializing, you're going to fall back into the same problem where, you know, it's only going to attract a certain type of user. Um, it's only going to attract people because, you know, whether it's bowling, uh, where people form bowling leagues with people they get on with, most humans, and I, you know, okay, at the end of the day, the problem is humans. I'm sorry. We are... Uh, I we, have... Yeah, sorry. We, we, we seek out... We tend... And this is a big generalization, but I think we tend to seek out things that we are comfortable with. We tend to seek out like things, mm -hmm. and so much of the software that we create reflects that, um, and, and I, I don't know. I, 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 I'm having a temporary little slight blackout. What is this service called where you call a random stranger? Chat roulette. Well, let's say chat roulette, all of yeah. these kinds of things. Wouldn't it be lovely if for every search you did, you would have like, where, where it says on Google, I'm feeling lucky. Yeah. It could be... I am a stranger, or like you could have, you could just have somebody completely, they could randomly give you somebody else's search results for the same thing, <laughs> if you yeah. want to look at that. I, that would be fun to do, at least for a day, Google, it's please. It's a good hack. You could, you could, you could put that, someone, uh, you, you could put that to a quick little hack on a weekend project for that one. I mean, there, it's just, that is, that is the challenge, right? Because you have to, if you want a product to change the world, it has to be used by millions and millions of people. Mm -hmm. In order for a product to be used by millions and millions of people, it, ha it, it, it seems to have to, it seems to have to require some amount of decision making where I'm choosing what subreddits to subscribe mm -hmm. to, I'm choosing what Twitter followers to follow, I'm choosing what Facebook friends to friend, I'm choosing what Pinterest boards to, like, I, 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 I don't know. It, whoever does it is obviously going to probably get a Nobel Prize. Um, yeah, there's a question right here. Hi, Alexis. Uh, Tom Cheridor, VentureBeat. Oh, hey, VentureBeat. What's yeah. up, man? Um, <laughs> um, I want to know why you haven't run for congressional office or... Because I'm unelectable. Or is it, is it that, or is it because uh, you wouldn't be Alexis Ohanian after Congress? Uh, I, okay, one, my girlfriend advised me strongly against it. Uh, and I, that's... <laughs> so I'm there not was gonna, a conversation. There was a conversation for a minute, for like, a, actually it was about five minutes. Um, and let's be clear, you know, who runs that relationship. And so I asked her, I was just like, look, I'm a smart guy, all right? <laughs> and, uh, and there was no way I was going to put her through that one. But two, um, the thing, again, relentless optimist, the thing that I'm hopeful for is that we can see a new type of political actor who is not, or actress, who is not connected through politics, who's not actually a politician, um, but who can have a political impact. And, and obviously history is full of these people. And I talked to the civil rights movement earlier. Like, but, but now we are we hopefully have technology that allowed them to scale that influence more, and then they won't have to take the bribes, uh, I mean, <laughs> lobbying dollars, in order to get into office. Um, so to, to, in a roundabout way, answer your question, yeah, I think if I did it, unless I was like Bloomberg rich, I would have to kowtow to whomever paid the bills. So we need to make you Bloomberg rich. I, yeah, Mayor, please, Mayor Bloomberg. One, uh, he wants to give you money, just time. say yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We have a question, last so. question right here. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Actually, I vote you give it to her, too. Yeah, you give it to her. So everybody who needs to be Bloomberg rich, just put your hand up, <laughs> and this guy's going to help sort you out. Tom's going to write some checks. <laughs> All right. We have... We don't have time for one more question. Oh. Do we have time for one more? Yes, we have time for one more question. Right there. There was an emergency hand, and I felt that might be important. Okay. You go. Uh, Justin Stahl from Zerpley. And um, my question is... You, it seems like you sort of subscribe to the ethos of, you know, Oscar Wilde, you know, I might not agree with you, but I'll defend to the death your right to make an ass of yourself. Mm -hmm. And um, I really like that thinking, but I, I must say I am a little bit conflicted in that I feel like there has to be a line at some point. And, you know, just reflecting on uh, this lady's comments, um, you know, you, you hear so much uh, hatred and being spewed out on the internet and you do, f you do have this kind of natural inclination that, you know, there should be a line, there should be some kind of action taken on people that are just coming out with just absolute nonsense. And it, it, it seems to be a lot of young people as well that just feel like there's no accountability on the internet. So I'm just interested from someone like, you know, that runs a community 
um, if you feel there is a line or it, there is some kind of action that can be taken, mm. or should they be allowed to express freely on the internet? Yes, okay. Thank you, briefly. So, uh, so if things one, I mean, I, I'm, Reddit, is, Reddit is a platform in the sense that like Twitter or WordPress are. There is not, I mean, there are subreddits just like there are Twitter accounts from everything like people who are probably Westboro Baptist Church supporters to a bunch of reasonable people, people who like cat photos. Um, there is a very important line that is the rule of law. And I don't know, it obviously varies country by country. Obviously, certain countries have very strong uh, anti-Nazi regulations with good reason um, that, that restrict speech on you know, neo-Nazi stuff. Um, the United States has very clear laws, you know, threats against one's life are inexcusable and illegal regardless. Um, I, the, 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 the f I think the most frustrating thing is, and this came up yesterday as well, um, and, and the research shows even if you give someone their real identity, even if they're using Facebook and it's their name and their photo and their parents can see it, they'll still do awful things. Um, there was that young teenager in Canada who committed suicide and her, her memorial page was being her, her was being vandalized by her own student, her fellow students using their Facebook accounts. And yes, when you see things like that, it's unconscionable. And how you, you wonder where the, you know, obviously where the parents, what happened to those kids that they would be able to do that. I just don't know. Uh, I don't know how we can, I don't have a good answer. There's no technological answer for me to curb that kind of behavior um, unless it's, I mean, the, the easiest solution would be to ask someone if they really, really want to post what they're about to say or like read it to them. You can actually do that with software. <laughs> um, it would be a robot. But I like at the end of the day, it's still, again, it comes back to humans. And it's a bigger change that it will have to require in order to stop the stuff that is legal but offensive. I think that's a very good way to end this uh, conversation and also in this conference, because it seems that this is a theme that we've touched upon again and again. Uh, and I think it shows a maturity in the conversation about the culture of the internet, saying, mm -hmm. well, here it is, now this is what we have built, and we have to go out and fix the problems in, mm -hmm. in the real world. Ladies and gentlemen, yeah. do you have a final word? I, I just hope all of you will continue to infect me with the, the sort of really positive and motivational talk that I've heard the last couple of days, because um, I'll be around till tomorrow, so let's have some nice conversations, and thank let's you for that. hosting. Alexis Ohanian. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, oh.